sir we are live now with all your permission sir i am starting yes. this session yes thank you yes sir good evening everyone present here i welcome all the participant doctors on today's session let's welcome today's speaker with great honor none other than professor dr vitul k gupta sir sir has done mbbs in md in medicine ficp fcsi fscp fiacm and health and human rights activist honorary teaching faculty as aims bhatinda and consultant at kishori ram hospital and diabetes care center kishori ram road vasant vihar bhatinda punjab today sir is going to discuss on a topic acute respiratory distress syndrome let me tell you overview of the topic acute respiratory distress syndrome that is ARDS is a severe and life threatening lungs condition characterized by rapid onset of respiratory failure although the exact cause of ARDS is not fully understood to know more this about topic i would like to invite sir and hand over this sir to about the topic over to you sir kindly proceed from here so thank you very much thank you ijcp for giving me this opportunity to discuss a rather important topic of a, uh, ARDS today. Next slide. Next. So to begin with, I must thank my late father, Comrade Vedika Gupta, for what I am today, and my friend, Professor Dr. Gurpreet Singh Wonder, for helping me throughout my academic career that I can accomplish so much academics or generated interest in academics and Dr. Paranjit Singh Olak for training us during internship. Next. And thanks to my family for wholehearted support. Next. So coming on to the topic, ARDS is a relatively common, disabling, lethal or life-threatening form of acute respiratory failure characterized by inflammatory pulmonary edema resulting in severe hypoxemia initially described by Ashback and colleagues in 1967. Originally, it was known as adult respiratory distress syndrome. When we were students, we knew this entity as adult respiratory distress syndrome, but now it is known as acute respiratory distress syndrome. ARDS represents an acute response to diverse etiologies. So mind you and mark this word, diverse etiology, risk and trigger factors resulting in bilateral lung opacities on radiography and hypoxemia. So two things are important. That is lung opacity, that is bilateral, as well as the condition of hypoxemia, which is the important part of ARDS. Next. So how do we define? ARDS was first defined in 1994 by American European Consensus Conference as acute onset of hypoxemia, that is arterial partial pressure of oxygen, that is PaO2, to fraction of inspired oxygen, that is FiO2 ratio is PaO2 over FiO2 is less than 200 millimeter of mercury. Acute lung injury with bilateral infiltrates on chest radiography with no evidence of left atrial hypertension. So there are three components. That is PaO2 over FiO2 ratio is less than 200 millimeter of mercury. There is acute lung injury with bilateral infiltrates on the chest radiography, and there is no evidence of left atrial hypertension. This is what constitutes a ARDS. In 2011, a consensus Berlin definition of ARDS was developed by a panel of experts, an initiative of European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, endorsed by the American Thoracic Society, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Next slide. All the definitions are based on clinical features, the chest imaging, because currently there is no validated diagnostic tool are available to measure lung permeability, edema, 
inflammation or diagnostic biomarkers. The American European consensus statement and the other definitions, Berlin definition, the Kegley definition, the criteria for AIDS are commonly discussed. Next. So this slide shows us the three definitions, important definitions, what we have discussed. And more important is the Berlin criteria, which is followed by most of the people. That depends upon time. That is within one week of a known clinical insert or new or worsening respiratory symptoms. If we consider oxygenation, it is divided into mild, moderate, and severe. Mild it when the ratio is more than 200 millimeter of mercury, but less than 300 millimeter of mercury. Moderate is when the ratio is more than 100 and less than 200 millimeter of mercury. And severe when the ratio is less than 100 millimeter of mercury. And when PEEP requirement, that is positive and expiratory pressure requirement, is minimum 3 centimeter of water and bilateral chest opacities are not fully explained, and origin of edema, the respiratory failure not fully explained by cardiac failure or fluid overload. So these criteria constitute the Berlin criteria, which is more commonly used criteria to define ARDS. Next. So compared with AECC definition, the Berlin definition has better prediction for mortality with increased percentage of mortality associated with in increasing stages of ARDS that is mild, it is 27%, moderate, it is 32% and severe, it is 45% with confidence interval of 95% as far as mortality is concerned. The severity of AIDS is classified according to degree of hypoxemia, what we have discussed in the previous slide, that is PaO2 over FiO2 ratio, which is mutually exclusive categories of mild, when the ratio is between 201 to 300, moderate when it is 101 to 200, and severe when it is less than 100. This is how we categorize ARDS. Next. So if we discuss the epidemiological features, population-based estimates of ARDS ranges from 10 to 86 cases per lakh with highest rate reported in Australia and United States. In low-income countries, ARDS is likely to be underreported because of the limited resources to obtain chest radiographs and measure the arterial blood gases. Next. So pathogenesis, AIDS occur as a consequence of alveolar injury due to various causes as we have discussed in the previous slide. So those, pre, those various causes are producing the diffuse alveolar damage. There is release of pro-inflammatory cytokinins. There is recruitment of neutrophils to the lungs. There is release of toxic mediators and damage to the capillary endothelium and alveolar epithelium leading to alveolar edema. So these are the pathogenetic compositions of ARDS. Next. So all these features, the pathogenic features leads to impairment of gaseous exchange, decreased lung compliance, increased pulmonary arterial pressure. The injury response manifests in three phases. So if there is insult, there is three phases of injuries. That is exudative phase. It is acute phase lasting one to six days. Then there is proliferative phase. That is subacute phase lasting seven to 14 days. And there is fibrotic phase, the chronic phase, which is, which is initiated after 14 days. So these are the pathogenetic responses manifesting in three stages exudative phase, proliferative phase, and fibrotic phase. Next. The exudative phase, this is known as acute phase, which lasts for one to six phase. This phase represents the lung's initial response to injury. 
विच इज करेक्टराइज बाई इनेट इम्यून सेल मीडिएटेड डैमेज टू एलवेलर एंड लुथीनियम एंड एपिथीलियल बैरियर एंड अकमुलेशन ऑफ प्रोटीन रिच डीमा फ्लूड विद इन द इंटस्टिशियम एंड एलवेलस the resident alveolar macrophages treat pro inflammatory cytokines leading to neutrophil and monocyte or macrophage recruitment as well as activation of alveolar epithelial cells and effector t cells to promote and sustain inflammation and tissue injury the endothelial activation and microvascular injury also contributes to the barrier disruption in ARDS and are worsened by mechanical stretches leading to diffuse alveolar damage so this is the characteristics of exudative phase which last for 1 to 6 days next then comes proliferative phase so this is subacute phase lasting from 7 to 14 days this is this is a repair process initiated during proliferative phase is essential for host survival it is characterized by resolution of pulmonary edema attempts to repair by prolification of type 2 alveolar cells the squamous metaplasia interstitial infiltration by myelofibroblasts and early deposition of collagen the provisional matrix restores the alveolar architecture and function and their may also be infiltrates of fibroblast and sub evidence of collagen deposition so basically this phase is a repair phase next so then comes the fibrotic or chronic phase which starts after 14 days so this is final or fibrotic phase does not occur in all the patients so depending upon the progress or mortality or there is resolution before the fibrotic phase can occur some patients progress to fibrotic phase characterized by obliteration of normal lung architecture diffuse fibrosis and cyst formation there is resolution of acute neutrophilic infiltrates with more mononuclear cells and alveolar macrophages in the alveoli in many patients gradual resolution of edema and acute inflammation takes place without fibrosis next so what are the risk factors for ards ards is not a disease but a clinical syndrome presenting with acute respiratory failure as a result of clearly determined pulmonary and non pulmonary predisposing factors but there is insufficient awareness about environmental and individual risk factors chronic alveolar abuse and active or passive cigarette smoking has been associated with an increase in incidence of ards the impact of environmental pollution on incidence of ards has not been established as such and role of vitamin d deficiency as a risk factor is still debated next so this table shows us the common risk factors for ards so direct risk factors are pneumonia aspiration of gastric contents inhalation injury pulmonary contusions pulmonary vasculitis and drowning and indirect risk factors are non pulmonary sepsis major trauma pancreatitis severe burns non cardiogenic shock drug overdose and multiple transfusions or transfusion associated acute lung injury so these are the common risk factors which are divided into directly affecting the lung and indirectly affecting the lungs next so genetic features and biomarkers are important because ards does not develop in majority of the patients with clinical risk factors you have seen in your practice that all the patients with these risk factors may not develop ards suggesting that other factors like genetic susceptibility play an important role in pathogenesis of ards which in turn is influenced by differences in coexisting conditions the virulence factors the environmental exposures like alcohol use active smoking or injurious mechanical ventilation practices so these factors they influence 
the the manifestations of ARDS in an individual. Next. Genetic studies suggest that about 40 genes influence the development or outcome of ARDS, including gene encoding interleukin 10, angiotensin converting enzyme, the vascular endothelial growth factor, or tumor necrosis factors. There are of several types. So these factors also influence the manifestation of ARDS in a person. Next. The adverse outcomes of ARDS has been linked to increased level of certain plasma biomarkers. That means if these biomarkers are present, so that will have adverse outcome of ARDS. Those markers are for epithelial injuries like receptors for advanced glycation and products and surfactant protein D, dysregulation, coagulation, systemic inflammation, and endothelial injury. So these are the biomarkers. If they are present, they will have adverse outcome effects of ARDS. Study of these biomarkers may help explain the pathogenesis of ARDS and help in identifying the treatment response subtypes of ARDS. Next. So how do we present? ARDS takes about two days to develop after hospitalization giving very little time for implementation of preventive strategies for ARDS. Studies suggest that strategies like efficient ICU care under intensivist, early volume resuscitation, antibiotics for sepsis, lower tidal volume for all mechanically ventilated patients. Next. Restrictive use of blood products prevent development of nosocomial ARDS. Glucocorticoids, aspirin, statin, beta agonists have failed in prevention trials. Although inhaled beta agonists prevent high altitude pulmonary edema, but they are not useful in ARDS. Results of small studies suggest that combination of beta agonists and glucocorticoids prevent development of AIDS but fail to provide mortality benefits. So only small studies have proven to be beneficial. Next. So treatment of ARDS is mainly supportive. As we have discussed the various risk factors, the various precipitating factors, and the various stages, we know that there is no specific treatment of ARDS. So treatment is focused mainly on supportive treatment and focusing on limiting further injury to the lungs by lung protective ventilation to prevent ventilation associated lung injury, conservative fluid therapy to prevent or reabsorb edema of lung along with identification of treatment for underlying cause like sepsis associated ARDS is treated with early resuscitation, appropriate antibiotic agents and control of sources of infection. Next. So to discuss one by one, what is lung protective ventilation? Invasive mechanical ventilation with lung protective strategy is the mainstay of ARDS treatment. The lung protective ventilation has reduced the mortality from acute lung injury from 40% in 2000 uh, to 25%. So there is a reduction of 50%, a uh, 15% mortality in 2006, the current practice guidelines by professional societies recommend low tidal volume and air pressure in invasive me mechanical ventilation. ARDS network trial has shown that IMV with lower tidal volumes and airway pressures as compared to the conventional approach of higher tidal volume results in absolute reduction of mortality in ARDS. Next. The peep of at least 5 cm of water is recommended, but a meta-analysis of trial in patients with moderate to severe ARDS suggests that mortality increases with relatively low peep as compared to high, higher peep. The optimum peep required is still unclear. So it is recommended that it varies from patient to patient and it is 
the intensivist vision to provide either low peep with low tidal volume or higher peep with high tidal volume according to the patient's requirement. A rational approach of adjusting peep or tidal volume in proportion to patient's respiratory system compliance is suggested, which minimizes the driving pressure, thus balancing the opening of lung and preventing achalactic trauma against over distension. So it is in the intensivist reason to adjust peep or tidal volume in proportion to patient's respiratory system compliance. So that is very, very important. So there is no clear cut guideline for peep or tidal volume. And it is individualized according to the patient's requirement. Next. But evidence also suggests that any level of tidal volume or air pressure which may be safe to uninjured lung may not be safe in ARDS or acute lung injury patients and may cause volume trauma, that is regional over distension, echelectric trauma by repeated opening and closing of the alveoli, or biotrauma, that is injury to epithelium or endothelium in injured lung, further increasing the injury and inflammation, meaning thereby that what tidal volumes and air pressure is good in uninjured lung may be dangerous in or unsafe in ARDS or acute lung injury patients. So we must keep these points in mind to protect it from volume trauma, acrylactic trauma and biotrauma. Long-term intubation may carry a high rate of complications as such as ventilator-associated pneumonia, delirium, critical illness, myopathy and neuropathy that is there for all long-term invasive ventilation patients. The optimal approach to lung protective ventilation is unknown. So we have to customize this on individual basis, depending upon the, the you can say, the intelligence of intensivist. Next. So prone ventilation, this was very prominently discussed during the COVID is presently recommended for moderate to severe ARDS as it improves oxygenation and reduces mortality. Beneficial effect is because of decrease in transpulmonary pressure gradient, helping in recruiting the collapsed area of lung without causing increase in airway pressure and reducing the risk of ventilator-associated lung injury and less compression on the left lobe of left lobe lower lobe by the heart. Prone ventilation was found to be significantly effective in obese patients with ARDS than in non-obese patients. Next. High frequency oscillatory ventilation seems to be ideal for lung protection in aid, the ARDS, but evidence suggests that it offers no advantage over conventional ventilation strategy and it may be harmful. A study shows no 30-day survival or cost-benefit in patients, though a patient-level meta-analysis suggests a benefit when PaO2 over FiO2 ratio is less than 60 mm of mercury, that is in sphere ARDS. Another meta-analysis shows no improvement with high-frequency oscillatory ventilation in survival in ARDS patients although there was no increase in risk of barotrauma or hypotension and also reduced risk of oxygenation failure. So this entity is new entity and may be tried as individually beneficial in some patients, especially of severe ARDS. Next. Airway pressure release ventilation may improve oxygenation and tolerance of mechanical ventilation, but has not been proven to reduce mortality. Both these ventilatory strategies may improve oxygenation by increasing mean airway pressure, which may adversely affect the hemodynamics. Next. Non-invasive ventilation and continuous positive airway pressure that is popularly known as CPAP is commonly used in mild ARDS but its use in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure is controversial and the choice may interface device 
is still debated. The NIV may increase risk of death in patients with severe hypoxemia. Oxygen administration to high flow nasal cannula and NIV provide, provided with a helmet may be effective alternative to invasive mechanical ventilation in patients with less severe ARDS. Both approaches has their potential to reduce respiratory drive and risk ventilation-induced lung injury. Next. Neuromuscular blockage agents are commonly used in ARDS, but their use is controversial. So I will not discuss this much. Deep sedation when given alone may be associated with the deleterious effects. Next. Fluid conservative therapy has shown benefit in ARDS patients in shortening duration of assisted ventilation, but does not improve survival and the benefit appears to occur largely after reversal of shock. In ARDS patients, due to increased alveolar vascular permeability, there is presence of alveolar edema, which may worsen as a consequence of fluid overload. Small randomized trials of diuretics and albumin after the shock reversal showed improved oxygenation and decreased duration of invasive mechanical ventilation, but a larger trial did not show mortality reduction with use of albumin in general ICU patients. For nutritional support, aggressive early calorie supplementation with parental nutrition may be harmful. Next. The intravenous beta-2 agonist in ARDS, a single centric art RCT, shows benefit of intravenous infusion of salbutamol for seven days in ARDS patients by causing significant reduction in extravascular lung water and plateau airway pressures. But a multicentric randomized control trial showed no benefit of intravenous salbutamol in ARDS patients and showed significant detrimental effects with an increased mortality. Next. Corticosteroids in ARDS, the role in ARDS patients is debated for decades. And mind you, most of the uh, intensivists still use corticosteroids. ARDS is considered to be an acute lung inflammatory disease as pulmonary and systemic inflammation plays an important role in pathogenesis and progression of ARDS. But corticosteroids with strong anti-inflammatory properties have not shown mortality benefits. A meta-analysis and review of eight RCTs and 10 cohort studies concluded that corticosteroids may be harmful in some patients and should not be routinely used in ARDS. So that goes for almost all the, all the treatment modalities we have discussed that none has been proven beneficial over the others. So it is the patient's requirement. So this intensivist has to apply their mind and what is the precipitating cause, what is the risk factors, and accordingly choose the modality out of all the modalities we have discussed, including corticosteroid. So there no, should be no generalized treatment for any ARDS patient. Next. Consensus exists about initiation of glucocorticoids if needed before 14 days of ARDS and in absence of large RCTs, a meta-analysis reinforced the role of prolonged low dose and slowly tapered glucocorticoids in management of ARDS. Another study suggested that glucocorticoids may improve oxygenation and airway pressure and in patients with pneumonia may hasten the radiographic improvement, but may not be associated with consistent mortality benefits and are harmful if started 14 days or more after ARDS have been diagnosed. Next. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, popularly known as ECMO, may be indicated in patients with severe ARDS, that is less, the ratio less than 60 millimeter of mercury with no improvement in oxygenation as observed after adequate lung protective and fluid restrictive therapy. One randomized trial suggested benefits of ECMO 
but failed to show if the benefit was because of ECMO or good specialized care since all referred patients were not treated with ECMO. The intravenous delivery of mesenchymal stem cells is a novel therapy approach in early clinical development of AIDS. So this is an experimental therapy as such, which interact with injured tissue through the release of multiple soluble bioactive factors. Next. So to discuss the pharmacological therapy, a large number of pharmacological therapies listed have been evaluated in trials for treatment of acute lung injury or ARDS, but none of these agents have been proved to be affected, although some might be effective in patients with specific causes of lung injury. So we have to choose out of these agents according to the patient's requirement, the precipitating factors, the risk factors and present state of ARDS. So those are glucocorticoids, surfactants, inhaled nitric oxide, antioxidants, protease inhibitors, neutrophilic elastase inhibition, anticoagulation, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, statins, and albuterol. Unfortunately, no pharmacological therapy for AIDS have been shown to reduce either short-term or long-term mortality. Next. So to summarize the management of AIDS, first is maintenance of oxygen level through intubation, mechanical ventilation in most of the patients, non-invasive ventilation for mild ARDS, or to decrease intubation rates, that is helmet better than the facial mask for oxygenation. Anti-inflammatory agents, Steroid, low dose methylprednisolone, 1 mg per kg per day helps to resolve ARDS. Fluid management to maintain central venous pressure of less than 4 mm of mercury or PAOP less than 8 mm of mercury to prevent pulmonary edema. Prone position or prone ventilation is quite effective. Decreased oxygen consumption by using antipyretics light sedation and analgesics, increased oxygen delivery by inotropic to increase the filling pressure, restricting transfusion and maintaining hemoglobin between 7 to 9 grams, inhaled ventilation that is nitric oxide, prostacyclin, the prostaglandins to improve the ventilation, uh, ventilation this thing mismatch. Next. Sportive care is the mainstay. That includes sedation and analgesia, neuromuscular blockade if sphere ARDS, hemodynamic monitoring and maintenance via the central venous cannula, nutritional support, maintenance of blood glucose levels, the VAP prevention and treatment that is ventilator associated pneumonia prevention and treatment, DVT prophylaxis, gastrointestinal stress ulcer prophylaxis and care of the bladder, bowel, and back. So that constitutes the ICU care, in fact. Next. Next. So coming on to the COVID-19 acute respiratory distress syndrome, that is ARDS related to COVID-19. ARDS as part of COVID-19 has different features and several questions remain unanswered. So if someone has COVID-19 ARDS, how does it compare and contrast with ARDS from other causes? Sphere COVID-19 represents the viral pneumonia from sphere ac acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 infection leading to ARDS. So basically, it is the cause is viral pneumonia leading to ARDS. Its manifestation can be viewed as a combination of two processes namely viral pneumonia and ARDS. Next. So COVID-19 illness can be confirmed by consistent clinical history, epidemiological cont uh, the contacts, and a positive test for detection of viral RNA in nasopharyngeal secretions using specific PCR tests. So this is important to diagnose the COVID-19 ARDS. 
and COVID-19 ARDS is diagnosed with confirmed COVID-19 infection. That means the Berlin 2012 ARDS diagnostic criteria, which we have already discussed, that is acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, presentation within one week of worsening respiratory symptoms, bilateral airspace disease on X-ray chest or CT scan or ultrasound that is not fully explained by effusion, lobar or lung collapse or nodules. So excluding all these things, if there are bilateral chest shadows, we consider it as evidence for ARDS. Cardiac failure is not the primary cause of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So we exclude the left ventricular failure in diagnosis of ARDS according to the Berlin criteria. Next. ARDS is underdiagnosed in ICU settings. ARDS dwells in 42% of the patients presenting with COVID-19 pneumonia and 61 to 81 of those requiring intensive care. Thus, that we have a ample experience now of COVID-19 in second wave. The COVID-19 ARDS follows a predictable time course over days with medium, medium time to intubation of 8.5 days after onset of symptoms. It is therefore important to monitor patient for development of ARDS as their COVID-19 progresses. Respiratory rate, SpO2 are the two important parameters allowing early recognition of ARDS in COVID-19. Next. A patient who fits anyone of the following conditions may have severe disease and require further evaluation. Respiratory rate more than 30 breaths per minute, the SpO2 less than 92% and PA2 over FiO2 is less than 300 millimeter of mercury. If these are present, the patient needs further evaluation very seriously to prevent or to treat ARDS in time. Next. Lung pathology in COVID-19 AIDS causes typical ARDS pathology, changes of diffuse alveolar damage in lungs. ARDS causes diffuse alveolar damage in lungs, highland membrane formation in alveoli in acute stages, followed by interstitial widening and by edema and fibroblast prolification in organizing stages. So all the three stages, what we have discussed before, that is acute stage, subacute stage, and chronic stage are there in COVID-19 ARDS also. As patients move through the course of their illness, the long-term outcome of ARDS are being reported with lung fibrosis appearing as a part of COVID-19 ARDS. Next. So thrombosis, pulmonary thrombosis is common in sepsis-induced ARDS. So it may be the part of COVID-19 or it is otherwise sepsis-induced. So thrombosis is common. Coagulation dysfunction appears to be common in COVID-19 and is detected by elevated D-dimer levels. In federal cases, there is diffuse microvascular thrombosis suggesting it thrombotic microangiopathy and most deaths from COVID-19 ARDS has the evidence of thrombotic disseminated intravascular coagulation. So that was a very dreaded complication where the mortality was very high. Some of the typical or unexpected manifestations seen in the lungs are dilated pulmonary vessels on CT chest, episodes of pleurotic pain, vascular enlargement is rarely reported in typical ARDS yet was seen in most cases of COVID-19 ARDS. So this is important differentiating factor between typical ARDS and it is COVID-19 ARDS that there is vascular enlargement and thrombotic disseminated intravascular coagulation. Next. COVID-19 ARDS appears to have worse outcome than ARDS from other causes. The intensive care unit and hospital mortality of typical ARDS are about 30, 35% and 40% respectively. For COVID-19 ARDS, the mortality ranges between 26 to 61%. Mortality in critical care setting 
is an on mechanical ventilation can range between 65 to 94% in sphere ARDS. Next. So risk factors for poor outcome, if we go in for analysis of the patient, if patient is of older age, there is presence of comorbidities such as hypertension, cardiovascular diseases and diabetes mellitus, lower lymphocytic count, kidney injury or raised D-dimer levels. So these are the poor prognostic risk factors. Death from COVID-19 ARDS is due to 53% respiratory failure, respiratory failure with cardiac failure that is in 33%. Myocardial damage and circulatory failure in about 7% and death from unknown cause is about 7%. So most of the patient of COVID-19 ARDS died from respiratory failure as well as from respiratory failure with cardiac cause that constitutes about 80% of all deaths in COVID-19 ARDS. Next. So the radiology in ARDS is distinctive, yet COVID-19 pneumonia appears to have unique features. So co-occurrence of viral pneumonia and ARDS allows radiologists to fairly specific in diagnosis of COVID-19 pneumonia. So that is why to start with COVID-19, the people were not getting the PCR test done, but they were getting CT scan done to diagnose COVID-19. The most discriminating feature of COVID-19 pneumonia in China as compared to viral pneumonia in the United States includes peripheral distribution of opacification, frosted glass opacity, this was typical, vascular thickening or enlargement, and these imaging features appears to be typical for COVID-19 pneumonia as compared to the other radiological features of ARDS. Next. As COVID-19 lung disease progresses, lesions are more likely to be bilateral, lower lung predominant, and they are multifocal. Often have the appearance of rounded opacities termed as COVID balls. With development of ARDS, extent of lung involvement increases with consolidative phase components. Opacities resolve with recovery from COVID-19. With ARDS, the lesions increase in their extent and density to evolve into fibrotic bands in long COVID syndrome. Next. So strategy for breathing support is very important in treating COVID-19 ARDS as with typical ARDS. So the breathing support remains the same, but the key elements we are going to stress again that use oxygen by nasal cannula to achieve SpO2 more than 92%. Use high flow nasal cannula is controversial and highly dependent upon treatment location. Avoid non-invasive ventilation. Prone ventilation appears to be beneficial and consider extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for rescue. So these are the key elements while treating, treating COVID-19 ARDS. Next. So to conclude, my dear friends, ARDS is a relatively common, disabling, and lethal or life-threatening form of acute respiratory failure characterized by inflammatory pulmonary edema resulting in severe hypoxemia. ARDS occurs as a consequence of an alveolar injury due to various pulmonary or non-pulmonary predisposing factors producing diffuse alveolar damage to ultimately all the causes that is pulmonary or non-pulmonary cause diffuse alveolar damage and severe hypoxemia, which are the hallmark of ARDS. ARDS does not develop in majority of the patient with clinical risk factors, suggesting that other factors like genetic susceptibility play an important role in pathogenesis of ARDS, which in turn is influenced by differences in coexisting conditions. Next. The timing of treatment remains to be major challenge of ARDS prevention trials and current evidence suggests that ARDS may not be preventable. The treatment, the treatment of ARDS is mainly sporting, limiting 
further injury to the lungs by lung protective ventilation to prevent ventilation associated lung injury conservative fluid management to prevent or reabsorb edema of the lung identification and treatment of underlying cause like sepsis associated ards is treated with early rescue appropriate antibiotic agents and control of source of infection next although there is no proven specific treatment for ards there has been considerable progress in managing patient with ards by using lung protective ventilation strategies as well as conservative fluid management future direction of research should focus on identification of me mechanisms of susceptibility primary prevention and early treatment as well as on target pharmacological therapies for this devastating condition including ards associated with covid-19 which again form a deadly combination of covid-19 presenting as ards next thank you very much with this i invite you all to 10th annual conference of association of physicians of india malwa branch in association with all india institute of medical sciences bathinda on 21st to 24th september it is being organized in auditorium aims bathinda thank you very much thank you so much sir for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us, with us and making this session informative one sir i definitely think this session knowledge is going to help all the participant doctors who join in this session sir it was a really wonderful session from your end i can see sir there is some question from the participant if you allow can yes. i take this question with all your permission please yeah sir first question is from dr bhunshri jaiswal he is asking why is the incident of acute respiratory distress syndrome is difficult to quantify no no it is not difficult to quantify so we have already discussed the classification if we want to quantify ards so it is classified into mild moderate and severe mild we quantify when pao2 over fio2 ratio is between 201 to 300 and moderate is when the ratio is 101 to 200 and it is less than 100 we quantify it as severe so the treatment is difficult but staging of ards is not difficult and we know with time also that we have exudative phase which lasts from 1 to 6 days we have proliferative phase that is subacute phase that is from 7 to 14 days and fibrotic phase after 14 days so if we can classify into mild moderate severe and according to time of presentation we can assess in which phase that is exudative phase proliferative phase or fibrotic phase the patient is in it so that is how we can quantify the ards as such thank you so much sir for answering this question sir moving forward i can see another question from dr agarwal he is asking when is a tracheostomy indicated in the management of ards what is the question please repeat sir the question is from dr agarwal he is asking when is tracheostomy indicated in management of ards so tracheostomy has got a totally different uh, indication when the patient is pro needs prolonged invasive mechanical ventilation so generally we say if mechanical ventilation is prolonged then we have the ventilation related complications like lung injury pneumonia etc so if it is more than 7 days of the invasive ventilation needed we should go for tracheostomy to prevent ventilation related complications to the lung thank you so much sir i hope that dr agarwal has received his answer we will take last question for today's session which is from dr kumar he is asking what factors lead to mortality in acute phase of ards what Sir, the question is from Doctor Kumar. He is asking, what factors lead to mortality in the acute phase of ARDS? The factors we have already discussed. The common risk factors they are direct. If patient is having ARDS with pneumonia, aspiration of gastric content, inhalation injury, pulmonary contusions, pulmonary vasculitis, drowning, 
and non the indirect risk factors that is sepsis trauma pancreatitis severe burns if all these patients have these risk factors then the mortality is high as compared to the non risk factor associated ards okay thank you so much sir as i can see there is no more question from the participant end sir but there is one feedback from dr shriyansh he has written wonderful presentation thank you for the session thank you welcome sir and sir as there is no more question with all your permission shall we conclude this session uh, thank you very much thank you all those who have joined this session again thank you very much thank you so much sir until then take care of yourself and hope to see you again with different topic in coming time sir yes thank have you. a great day sir welcome thank you. sir